Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters, and good morning. As we open the words of Sister White, and we consider more carefully the words of the prophet Zephaniah, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction, for his guidance, his watch care, and his blessing as we do this. As we come before him on the Sabbath day, <clears throat> shall we now pray? <clears throat> Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath and for its hours of rest. We thank you, Father, for these many blessings that you have provided through this week that is now past, and for this day in which we come before you. <clears throat> as we open these words, Father, as we come to consider these words, we need you. We need the protection of your angels, the guidance of your spirit, and we need your wisdom to carefully divide the word of truth. I thank you, Father, for this opportunity to join together. <clears throat> I thank you for this group that comes before you, meets with you on Sabbath, for each one that participates in these meetings. Direct us now. Help us so that we may more clearly understand the warnings that are before us and the guidance that you have for us. We thank you and we praise you for these opportunities. And we seek your blessing. For this we praise you and for this we thank you. Now and always, in the name of Jesus, amen. Now, what is before you was from the 11th of October, 1906, the title being Universal Guilt During the Time of the End. As Mrs. White addressed, there is coming rapidly and surely an almost universal guilt upon the inhabitants of the great cities because of the steady increase of determined wickedness. God has given life to man in order that through a knowledge of the word and by practicing its principles, the human agent may become one with God, obedient to the divine will. But Satan has been working constantly by many devisings to bring man into disfavor with God. In this situation, as Brother Ron pointed out last Sabbath, there is almost a universal guilt. It does not reside only on the inhabitants of the great cities. But this is something that is an almost universal guilt upon this world. But the great cities are the hotbed of this rebellion against God. In the antediluvian world, human agencies brought in all manner of devisings and ingenious practices to make of no effect the law of Jehovah. As Solomon wrote, there is nothing new under the sun. At this time in Earth's history, are we not very much like the antediluvian world? They cast aside his authority because it interfered with their schemes. 
in the days before the flood. So now the time is right upon us when the Lord God must reveal his omnipotent power. How many times are we hearing now where many of those that seek power are casting aside the authority of God? Maybe they are not doing it openly. Green New Deals. Worshipping the creation rather than the creator has become almost normal in this world today. We must save the environment. We must worship Mother Earth. Climate change, <clears throat> because we must control the climate. We must be as God. Even many of those who claim to believe the truth do not practice the truth. They have the word, but they do not live in accordance with its precepts. How much more blunt does she need to be? Their business affairs are not conducted in harmony with its teachings. In the plans devised by men, who desire to execute their own purposes, the revealed mastery, masterly hand of the enemy. Let me read that again. Their business affairs are not conducted in harmony with its teachings. In the plans devised by men who desire to execute their own purposes is revealed the masterly hand of the enemy. Satan is not asleep. He is wide awake. To make of no effect the sure word of prophecy. With skill and deceptive power, he is working the counterwork, the expressed will of God, made plain in his word. For years, Satan has been gaining control of human minds through subtly soft sophistries that he has devised to take the place of the truth. In this time of peril, right doers in the fear of God will glorify his name by repeating the words of Daniel. It is time for thee, O Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. In all that we are seeing occurring right now, in all the events of the world, in all of the events that surround us, we are observing what our adversary would choose to put into place. Through his prophet Zephaniah, the Lord specifies the judgments that he will bring upon evildoers. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea <clears throat> and the stumbling blocks with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place. And them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops. And them that worship and swear by the Lord. And that swear by Malcolm. And them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired of him. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice, 
he hath bid his guests. <clears throat> Zephaniah 1, 2 to 7. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children, and all such are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day also I will punish all those that leap on the threshold, which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. Zephaniah 1, 8, and 9. What do we take it to mean when the princes, the king's children, and such that are clothed with strange apparel are being addressed? How are we to apply this symbolically? Well, if you're looking at, um, now it says in the day of the Lord's sacrifice. So right. what would that be? What is that a reference to? <clears throat> would it be the day of atonement? I would think so. That's um, the way I would take it. Yeah. So this is talking about our time. And that I will punish the princes. So that would be, um, who would the princes be in this verse? <clears throat> Well, as we have addressed previously, <coughs> we are looking at this first to ourselves, then to the movement, and then to the church at large. Right. So, so here would this be civil and religious authority within right. the church? Exactly. And when we had looked at, at princes before, that, that's the word sar. So often that refers to um, uh, so that's usually a civil authority. It means lots of different things, but um, and but the king's children, that's Melek, which is um, so that's the king. So that again, these actually look both like civil authority. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how we would apply it to our time specifically. Civil authority within the church, would that be the administration of the church? I would think it would have to be. But if it was in this movement, who would that be? Or what would it represent? I think the warning that's being given is for all of us to consider. Now, granted, we do not have a civil authority, quote unquote, within the movement. Well, we have a de facto civil authority. Okay. Now, a comment from the chat gives a reference from Psalm 50, verse 5, and then Revelation 19, verses 17 and 18. Why? Focusing on the word sacrifice. When Christ is coming, he, or just before he comes, he says, gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And in Revelation 19, it talks about gathering the, those that are being punished together to be destroyed, basically. Um, eating the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, and so forth. And this mentions animals that are going to be eaten. So it's judgment. Okay. But I find this, this portion here where he will punish the princes and the king's children and all such are clothed with strange apparel. 
How are we? They came to the, yeah, they sorry, they came to the wedding feast without Christ's character. And last time we went went over this, when I saw the king's children and the princes, I was thinking of the mainstream church's hierarchy. But it's more than that, of course. But what symbol do we see with this that are clothed with strange apparel? Is it not that these are those that refuse to accept the character of Christ? They lift, themselves, they lift themselves up and don't lift up the character of Christ. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be the noise of a cry from the fish gate, and an howling from the second, and a great crashing from the hills. How will ye inhabitants of Maktesh? For all the merchant people are cut down. All they that bear silver are cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their leaves, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore, their goods shall become a booty and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and not drink the wine thereof. Why is it important that there is a noise from the fish gate and a howling from the second? What is the fish gate? And yet, what is the second? Those are good questions. Um, well, the second is kind of interesting because it means a repetition. So my, my question on the second is, is this a howling because of the second angel's message? Well, I don't know. Um, it's interesting, though, because the word is Mishnah. Okay which is uh, the Mishnah is the name for um, a commentary on uh, the Talmud. Right. So it, that's why it's, it's called the Manesha because it's a repetition or a commentary. So, but I'm not sure about the fish gate. I mean, what this particularly uh refers to. I mean, it's it's the word dog in Hebrew. Um, Why is there a great crashing from the hills? <clears throat> well, what it seems like there is an echo is what I kind of think of it as. All right. A cry from the fish gate, a howling from the second and a great crashing from the hills. This seems to me some kind of echo or repeat of history or something like that. But I just don't, I mean, there's obviously three that are mentioned in this verse. And then there's also how ye inhabitants of Mechtesh. Right, so you got all this noise, right? So the word that is is being used here, translated as fish gate. Dog. Yeah, dog. Like in Dagon. Right. Fish god. A squirming. Mm -hmm. I mean, a fish out of water flops around. Yeah. those that are taken out of their element become very unsure of themselves, very nervous. 
Uh, I'm reading here about the fish gate. It says it was an ancient gate on the east wall, just west of the Gihon or Gihon Spring, where men gather to sell fish, <clears throat> sometimes in violation of the Sabbath. And then it gives Second Chronicles 33, 14, etc. And then yeah. it says this may be the same as the middle gate. Jeremiah 39 3, but it's more likely to be the modern day Damascus gate. So this was surrounding the city Jerusalem. Yeah, and this in, in Nehemiah they rebuild this gate. Um and they talk about that. Uh and from above the gate of Ephraim, above the old gate and above the fish gate, the Tower of Haniel and the Tower of Mia, even unto the sheep gate. Um and the context here is um, uh, just this rebuilding that goes on and uh, all these dedications and so dedication of the wall is when they're talking about that. So they have all these people set out around the wall and uh, they're dedicating the wall. So they mention the fish gate in that context. Okay. So, but the idea that you have this cry from the fish gate, and then the second, and uh, I mean, what particularly this would normally mean, I don't know. Um, but you know, it could refer to a a group of people, uh, a rank or order or something like that. But I don't think that that's what it refers to here in this context. Okay. So, so this would refer to, to a repetition. So Brown's driver Briggs says a double, a copy, a second, a repetition. Um, now it could also refer to uh, an area, the second quarter. So that, that would be possible in, in the original context. But the idea that it is a repetition, I think, is, is rather interest, interesting. And then a great crashing from the hills. So to me, this would imply, again, um, I think the sound is going to be reflected back like an echo. But, but that's just my um, opinion. OK. Um, Why is the admonition being presented? Howl ye inhabitants of Maktaesh. What is so important about one area of Jerusalem, Maktaesh? Yeah, so this is a valley or a hollow in greater Jerusalem area. What does Maktaesh mean? Where is it? What's the derivative of this? Well, it comes from um, a mortar, by analogy, a socket of a tooth or a hollow place. And it goes a bit deeper there. Um, Um, the katash to butt or pound. Hmm. You know what that means. Okay. How will ye inhabitants from Maktaesh? For all the merchant people are cut down. Not some, not many, all the merchant people are cut down. All they that bear silver are cut off. The economy is destroyed. There is nothing that can be done for the merchant people are cut down. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles. Why is he searching Jerusalem with candles? 
Is this not a very close examination? An examination. Amen. Okay, an examination that that cuts right to the heart of the matter. And punish the men that are settled on their leaves. Why are they so indolent? Why are they so self assured? Why do they say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil? What is the saying? What will be, will be. What is the saying that has been said regarding these, these other presentations? Well, you're talking about time will tell? Yep, I'm talking directly about time will tell. Well, is this, this is definitely, <clears throat> sorry, this is definitely aimed at those who are self-righteous very complacent. It's the message to Laodicea. But is this also not a more pointed description than time will tell when they are saying the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil? There is no Sunday law in the pipeline. The church will make it through. Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Oh, no, we won't. We're safe. We're God's chosen. Therefore, their goods shall become a booty and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near a doubling, and hasteneth, hasteneth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty men shall cry there bitterly, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Zephaniah 1, 14 to 18. Is there any better description of what is occurring here than what we have just studied regarding Abimelech? Yes, and also where it's mentioning that they'll plant vineyards and not drink the wine thereof, they'll build houses and not inhabit them. That's the reverse of what's going to be going on on the new earth. So we don't expect these people to be on the new earth. They won't be redeemed. Okay. Did Abimelech not come against the fenced cities? And did he not come against high towers? Yet, here is Abimelech. He was not accepted as one of Gideon's sons. He was the son of a strange woman. He came as a mighty man, but he came with a character unlike that of Christ. 
you could say that Abimelech, in the way that he approached things, was representative of the Antichrist. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Before the decree, before the day, before the anger, before the day of the Lord's anger. Are, the, are these not giving references to four steps presented again and again for our consideration? How do we stand in the day of the Lord's anger? How can we stand without his character? Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Woe unto the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Carathites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. Zephaniah 2, verses 3 and 5. As I read this, I was asking myself the question, why was verse 4 skipped over? For we read there, for Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Is this not representative of what will happen to the world? What other symbol can we draw from this? What other symbol can we see? In many places, there exist conditions that make these words of warning applicable in this our day. Is she speaking only about what she sees in 1906? Or are we, see, are we seeing this with application to what is happening in 2022? What say you? Well, she says that the, the earthquake in San Francisco um, is a fulfillment of this, but we know that it's typical of what's going to happen. Should not the terrible earthquake that has caused almost complete destruction of San Francisco, one of the largest cities of America, awaken a most earnest interest to seek the Lord while he may be found? Let not our ministers in their discourses dwell upon commonplace matters. Let not our ministers in their messages dwell upon commonplace matters, matters that have no eternal import, matters that are not of God, but are of man. Now is a time where there should be a humbling of the heart before God. Let us seek him while he is to be found on the pardoning side and not on the judgment side. 
Wake up, my brethren and sisters. You have no time to lose. Call upon the Lord while he may be found. Wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation, even with all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Zephaniah 3, verse 8. The yeah, remnant... and me, yeah, and to me, this, this because uh, we looked at this last time, but um, just to kind of reiterate this, um, when we have this uh, indignation, uh, we know that there is, um, this can relate to the 2520. Right. And, and also this rising up to the prey reminds us of Isaiah chapter 8 with uh, Mahal Shala Hashbaz. Um, so, so this is, which also relates again to the 2520. So the 2520, of course, is a judgment that came upon literal Israel and was um, a period that a persecution that extended to the Millerite time period. And, but now it's, we can apply it to our time as well. Okay. <clears throat> The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Zephaniah 3.13 In this our day, some whose tongues are deceitful have been presenting as truth many things that they themselves have originated, as if the law of truth were in their heart and coming from their lips. But the Lord will surely punish every deceitful lying tongue that has caused the people to err and to turn from the righteousness of Christ. There are those that set aside anything that Mrs. White had to say. Was Mrs. White of, dis, of a deceitful tongue? Far from it. And notice that's in paragraph 13. Okay. But was she of a deceitful tongue? Negative. No, she certainly wasn't. So this is not being written about Mrs. White, but this is written about those that would set her and her writings aside. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He has cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear thou not. And to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. The, Lord's, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly, who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at the time I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth, and gather her that was driven out. And I will get them praise and fame in every land 
where they have been put to shame. Zephaniah 3, 14 to 19. At that time, I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. For I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth. When I turn back your captivity from your eyes, saith the Lord. Zephaniah 3.20. Mrs. White wrote further at about this same time. And we find these additional items written in the Ninth Testimony, beginning on page 48. Let church members bear in mind that the fact that their names are registered on the church books will not save them. Membership does not have its advantages. Just because your name is registered on earth as being of the church of God does not mean that in heaven your name is written in the book of life. What a chilling thought for many. They must show themselves approved of God, workmen that need not be ashamed. What does this mean to each of us? <clears throat> How can we be a workman that need not be ashamed? Are we doing everything in our lives to the glory of God? How are we to be as workmen that need not be ashamed? Day by day, they are to build their characters in accordance with Christ's directions. Can you build your character according to Christ's direction if you are stealing, if you are lying, if you are setting aside his precepts? Can you be building your character according to Christ's direction if you are taking the admonitions of the world that set aside the health message, that set aside true worship? They are to abide in him, constantly exercising faith in him. Thus, they will grow up to the full stature of men and women in Christ, wholesome, cheerful, grateful Christians, led by God into clearer and still clearer light. Can we set aside any of the light that we have received since July 18th? What say you? It would be extremely unwise and destructive to do so. If this is not their experience, they will be among those whose voices will one day be raised in the bitter lamentation. The harvest is past. The summer is ended and my soul is not saved. Why did I, why did I not flee to the stronghold for refuge? Why have I trifled with my soul's salvation and done despite to the spirit of grace? Why have I set aside the words of warning? Why have I chosen not to accept the light that is given of chronology? showing us that the hand of God is leading 
in everything to bring his message forward. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteneth greatly. Zephaniah 1.14. Let us be shod with the gospel shoes, ready to march at a moment's notice. Every hour, every minute is precious. We have no time to spend in self-gratification. All around us, there are souls perishing in sin. Every day, there is something to do for our Lord and Master. Every day, we are to point souls to the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. How better to point souls to the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world, than by showing his character in everything that we do. Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 44. Go to your rest at night with every sin confessed. Thus we did in 1844. We expected to meet our Lord. And now this great event is nearer than we had first believed. Be ye also ready in the evening, in the morning, and at noon. And when the day when the cry is heard, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. You may, even though awakened out of sleep, go forth to meet him with your lamps trimmed and burning. Now, this first passage, these first passages were from Nine Testimony, pages 48. When we come down to nine testimony, page 95 and 95, two weeks later, on our homeward journey, we passed through San Francisco and hiring a carriage spent an hour and a half in viewing the destruction wrought in that great city. Buildings that were thought to be proof against disaster were lying in ruins. In some instances, buildings were partially sunken in the ground. The city presented a most dreadful picture of the inefficiency of human ingenuity to frame fireproof and earthquake-proof structures. Did we not see this occur as a warning for us on 9-11? Have we not addressed that this symbol of 9-11 is important for us today and has been important in the world. How many people do we, do we encounter that do not understand or remember where they were on September 11th, 2001? Through his prophet Zephaniah, the Lord specifies the judgments that he will bring upon evildoers. And again, I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heavens and the fishes of the seas and the stumbling blocks of the wicked. And I will cut off man from the land, saith the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day also, I will punish all those that leap upon the threshold, which fill their master's houses with violence and with deceit. How many times do we need to be warned? How many times do we need to have this put before us in the messages of 
Zephaniah and repeated by Mrs. White. Before we start to wake up and understand that this is a very serious time. When we come to the end of our day, when we are confessing our sins, how many are choosing to confess the issues that have led to separation from other brothers and sisters? Let not this sin be upon us. Let not this issue be said to be ours. We are not responsible for the attitude of others. We are not responsible for their decisions to cast others out. We are responsible only for our own issues, for our own decisions. For if we treat them as Christ would have treated them, do we not heap coals upon their heads? If we seek, go ahead. Excuse me, Dwight. I just want to bring up, if we have done something and it stumbles somebody else or has made someone really upset with us, we should try our best when we find out about it to make things right. And then it's on the other party as to whether they want, want, want to reconcile or not. So when you said we're not, not responsible for the way they feel, sometimes in a way we are, like maybe we're actually not wrong, but they have misinterpreted what we've said or done. But sometimes we are wrong. And I know I <clears throat> annoyed a lot of people because it's coming back at me. And I have to confess, well, I'm sorry, but the people that are talking to you about me should have come to me directly, according to Matthew 18, and then possibly we could have worked it out, but that isn't happening. Okay. Any other comments about what I just said? I mean, if I if I said something incorrectly, then I wish to be corrected. How else would you see this? I'm stating this from what I have observed. There have been those that are not happy with many of the things that have been being presented since July 18th. Within this in the movement, there are those that view the comments and the presentations that have been made as being something that is not worthy for consideration. Last evening, I received a message from a brother that I've not heard from for many months. It has surprised me to hear from him. Because many months ago, the presentations that I had made, that I was led to make, both at the School of the Prophets and in the Sabbath sessions leading up to December 6th, all of these presentations were removed from anything having to do with Future for America. In a manner of speaking, I was cast out. Did it make me sad? Yes. Not because I was cast out, but because everything that had been said, everything that had been presented was just as is being presented right now from the words of Sister 
quite in combination with the scripture? Am I to apologize for these presentations? No. Of course not. No. You know, in these in these type of situations, yes, my heart grows heavy. Because there's many things that Mrs. White presented for our consideration that cut deeply. When those presentations were removed from FFA, it was the decision of a few because I had stood up, because I disagreed with comments that were being made because I had disagreed with the decision of the few to remove anything that was presented by one person, by Theodore. They did not like the fact that one person would stand up. I accepted what they had to say, but my heart was still heavy. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and will punish the men that are settled on their leads that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore, their goods shall become a booty and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. When you plant a vineyard, as Noah did, you look forward to the time that you may make use of the wine thereof. You look forward to accepting the doctrine, the wine. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteneth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty men shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all of them that dwell in the land. Zephaniah 1, 2, 3, 8 to 18. God cannot forbear much longer. Already his judgments are beginning to fall on some places, and soon his dis signal displeasure will be felt in other places. Do we wish to be where God's displeasure? And his judgments are going to fall. Do we wish to be part of those judgments? I would say no. Do we wish to set aside the words of warning? The words by which we can see that the judgments are coming and coming more quickly than the world would anticipate. 
how are we to react at this time? There will be a series of events revealing that God is the master of the situation. With the presentation that was given last night, are we not able to see the hand of God in everything that has been being addressed up to and since July 18th of 2020? Are we not seeing that it takes much more than man's finite wisdom to present these patterns over and over and over again for our consideration? Are we to ignore the lessons that we are seeing? We have understood a little bit about the number 220, about the 2300, about the 1260, about the 1335, and about the seven times. But these patterns are repeated for us to help us focus on that which we are to do. The truth will be proclaimed in clear, unmistakable language. Have the messages of Revelation 14 in total been proclaimed in clear, unmistakable language? Has the message of Revelation 18 been proclaimed in such a manner? What say you? That work still needs to be done. Amen. Consider this, my brothers and sisters. This work not only needs to be done, but it needs to be proclaimed clearly, directly, without reservation. The first two messages of Revelation 14 were given clearly by Father Miller and those that proclaimed that portion of the message. That third angel's message. Announcing that the hour of his judgment is come has yet to be clearly proclaimed. There are those that will say that it's just about the Sunday law. There are those that will say it is just about righteousness by faith. Yet it is an invitation. It is the sweetest invitation that has ever been given to man. Yet it is the invitation that many choose to set aside. As a people, we must prepare the way of the Lord under the overruling guidance of the Holy Spirit. Why? How do you see this? Have we accepted the leadership of the Holy Spirit? Have we accepted his overruling guidance? Or have we said like others, we are doing for the Lord. We are publishing for the Lord.
We are correcting the mistakes that is found within what Mrs. White wrote. We are making her writings more clear because we're changing her writings. Is this preparing the way of the Lord under the overruling guidance of the Holy Spirit? No. Is casting out brothers and sisters because of fear in any other manner preparing the way of the Lord under the overruling guidance of the Holy Spirit? I don't think so. The gospel is to be given in its purity. The stream of living water is to deepen and widen in its course. In all fields, nigh and afar off, men will be called from the plow and from the more common commercial business vocations that largely occupy the mind and will be educated in connection with men of experience. We are to become educated. We are to become educated even if we have had damage to our minds through the use of alcohol, through the use of drugs, through other issues. Maybe a physical ailment, maybe a physical accident. We are yet to become educated. We are to become educated to give a message in clear, unmistakable language under the overruling guidance of the Holy Spirit. Does this mean that we are to go to Andrews for our education? Does this mean we are to go to Pacific Union College for our education? Does this mean that we are to go to those that are accredited for our education? I would say that such could easily be shown like that which was said of John and of Christ, that had they been schooled, had they been educated in the schools of the rabbis, that they would have been unfitted for the work that was then before them. The same is true of us today. As they learn to labor effectively, they will proclaim the truth with power. Are we to labor according to man's understanding of the gospel? Or are we to labor according to to that of God's leading in giving the message of the gospel under the overruling guidance of the Holy Spirit. Through most wonderful workings of divine providence, mountains of difficulty will be removed and cast into the sea. Are we going to see this literally, or will we see this symbolically? What do you think? The I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? Through the most wonderful workings of divine providence, 
mountains of difficulty will be removed and, ca and cast into the sea. Are we speaking here literally or are we speaking symbolically? It would be symbolically. I would agree. The message that means so much to the dwellers upon the earth will be heard and understood. Men will know what is truth. Onward and still onward, the work will advance until the whole earth shall have been warned. And then the end will come. How much more direct did she need to be? How much more clear could she have been than she has been in this one paragraph from Nine Testimonies, page 96? It's pretty clear. I mean, I don't have any problems understanding it. Yeah, and, and this has been a problem in this movement in that we expect the end to come before this work is done. So we expect a Sunday law to come before the church and the world have been properly warned. Um, but this council would tell us that we can't look now uh, for a Sunday law until this work is done. We can't look for those. We can't look for those end, end events to be fulfilled. Uh, unless we understand the order of their fulfillment. The order of their fulfillment is that the message of warning first goes. Is it not clear that our characters need to become like that of Christ's before we can be prepared to give this message? It seems very clear. What else are we to see? How else are we to react? If we will not look to prepare the way of the Lord, under the overruling guidance of the Holy Spirit. If we will not look for this preparation to be done by the third person of the Godhead, if we are then setting aside the validity of the third person of the Godhead, are we not then choosing to be directed by our adversary. We need the Holy Spirit. We need that third person just as much as we need the third message of Revelation 14. The message has arrived. To a point, the message has begun to be formalized. But have we accepted that that message is yet to be empowered? I would say not all of us. I would have to agree. then what are we to do so that the message can be empowered? There are many, there are many within the world that would gladly proclaim that a Sunday law is soon to fall and soon to come. 
but are they willing to do so with a perfected character, a character perfected by Christ and the Holy Spirit and not by man? The true third angel's message will lay the glory of man in the dust. The true third angel's message will make man's glory as no better than that as a worm. Consider that for, for a moment, brothers and sisters. Because if your glory is no better than that as a worm, then how can a worm be lifted up? How can a worm draw men unto them? Christ is to be lifted up. When our characters are made right, people will not see the worm. People will see Christ and him crucified. People will come to understand the message of fear God. Give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. The hour of his judgment in the present tense has arrived. Now, as we're coming toward the close of today's session, are there any other comments or questions regarding what we have just read? Um, when you read the, sorry, Theodore, go ahead. Um, did you notice there's 45,600 words in your document? No, I hadn't noticed that. Okay, and that's the number of, in the numbering of the tribes, that's the numbering of the tribe of Benjamin in um, uh, Numbers 26, 45,600. It's just an interesting note. Well, it's, in, it's very interesting in the, in the entire document because what's before you right now is just regarding Zephaniah chapter one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to comment about where you read the, uh, the, the ca captivity will be turned before your eyes. Yes. And I know that's about re restoration on a large scale, but I was also thinking of there's a person that I'm, trying to feed, I say trying to feed because she's very easily involved with a whole lot of stuff, right? And she knows she's under conviction, but she always has an excuse as to why she can't perform what the Lord is convicting her to do. And I thought, well, that's like, you're focusing on what's holding you back. But if you would just turn to the Lord, he will make those rough places smooth. I mean, that's the challenge we all face. We can always have an excuse for why we're putting off what we ought to be doing. A major thing we're putting off. And the most important thing is to surrender to Christ and let him take over our lives so that we can overcome those problems that those defects are those obstructions, whatever it is, that's holding us back. And I, and I told her, I said, since I've been 
moving more to Christ, I've prevented a lot of crises that used to happen in my life uh, reoccur. I'm trying to get that through to her. So please pray that she wakes up to this fact. Yes, I, even if it's just one little baby step at a time, the Lord will amplify that. Thank you for that. Now, are there any other comments? Any other questions? In closing, my admonition is to consider these words of Zephaniah and Sister White very, very carefully. They are in full agreement. They are the words of prophets that are of equal stature. They are given for our admonition and for the time in which we now live. Shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to consider carefully these examples, to consider carefully these admonitions. We ask you now, Father, for your blessing through the rest of this Sabbath day. We ask for your watch care, for your direction. We thank you for the receipt of these warnings and for the opportunity that we have to turn from that which we have valued, which is of none effect, to that which is of eternal import. Be with us now. I pray, Father, for the meetings that will occur later today for your guidance, for your watch care, and your direction upon each of us, those that have contributed and those that have attended. Be with us now in all things. May that which we do glorify you, may glorify Christ, and bring glory to your characters and the work that you would have us to do. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.